Hello, and welcome to another episode of Team Blush. This is part 10 in the KA24 E Turbo series. In the last episode, we left you hanging pretty much in this exact same spot. We got the engine out of the car, and our next task is to take all of the parts from this engine that we can reuse and put them on our new forged engine that is going to be going in the car. As well as swapping parts over, we're going to be doing our best to simplify and delete as much useless stuff off of this engine as possible, which includes a lot of this emission stuff, the infamous butterfly flaps in the intake runners, as well as we're going to just try and get some stuff cleaned up on here before moving it over to our new cleaner engine. Things are starting to move along quite quickly. The puzzle pieces are starting to finally fall into place. This should be a pretty fun process, just literally swapping things over for the most part. I think we're gonna go ahead and undo the transmission first, just get that away from the engine. That'll make working on this a lot easier. We're gonna get right into that and we will see you there. While you are watching us remove the transmission from the engine, we want to go ahead and apologize. Our voice is a little messed up. We have been sick, so that's partly the reason that this episode was delayed. But we are now feeling better, and we can continue plugging along on this engine. We just wanted to ask that you bear with us for the voiceover in this video. With that aside, getting the transmission off of the engine is really easy. Just take all of the bell housing bolts off. When you are taking out the two bell housing bolts for the starter, be careful. We were not paying attention and our starter just clattered onto the ground. But once you get all those bell housing bolts out of the way, you can go ahead and just pull the transmission back. And then it helps to wedge some tire irons or crowbar or something in between the bell housing and the engine block just to help wiggle that input shaft out of the engine. Once we did get the transmission out of the way, we got access to our pressure plate, clutch, and flywheel. This is the same pressure plate, clutch, and flywheel combo that we installed in our manual transmission swap video. So if you were curious about how that has been holding up, you can see in this video that the clutch looks pretty good. We are surprised this is all just eBay stuff. Granted, it hasn't been holding much power, but we have been semi-daily driving it, and for the price, we'd honestly run this exact same kit again if we were going to manual swap the car. Now we can go ahead and start the scary process of beginning to remove a lot of the EGR equipment on the intake in order to get it out of the way so that we can actually remove the intake. We are going to try and explain this as best as we possibly can, but if we are unable to convey this in a way that makes sense to you or you yourself get confused by this process, don't worry because near the end of the video we go over on the manifold all of the points that we capped off for vacuum as well as we show off the lines that we rerouted for the coolant. Another thing to keep in mind if you are getting overwhelmed is that if you are not running a standalone ECU Every single EGR component aside from the air regulator and the associated intake air control valve on the back of the manifold gets deleted if you are deciding to remove the EGR from your engine. If you are running a standalone ECU, then you can actually go ahead and remove the air regulator and the intake air control valve. We personally did not because we wish to retain air conditioning on this car. But if you are running standalone, you can delete that and you can tune for the disparity of not running that. With those thoughts aside, let's go ahead and dive into this confusing process. What we've been taking off is the hardline mess that connects the pressure regulator control solenoid and the swirl control valve control solenoid. <laughs> it's a mouthful, but that's what that is all connected to. And we're also showing off two components that we did not have on the engine that we took off a long time ago. That is the EGR control valve 
that gets blocked off with this little red plate and our BPT valve that sits on top of the intake manifold. This is also something that we deleted prior to this video. Moving around to the bottom side of the front of the intake here, we can go ahead and remove this EGR component. We actually didn't know what this was in the prior episode, but after a little bit of research, we learned that this is the solenoid that controls the EGR control valve that we already removed prior to this video. And since there is no EGR control valve for this to run, we'll go ahead and delete it from our application. In this scene, we simply just wanted to show that we pulled all of the three vacuum hoses off of the hard line that is tucked underneath the intake. And we also wanted to show that we ended up cutting this largest vacuum hose that connects to the manifold. This ends up getting capped off, but we still wanted to show you our process. The next thing that we wanted to address on the back of the intake here is the swirl control valve actuator. This is the lever that actually controls the butterfly valves inside of the intake. And because this is absolutely notorious for stripping the two Phillips head screws when you are taking it off, we wanted to go ahead and use an impact driver on these two screws before we go ahead and take the intake off of the motor. It would be much harder to hit this with an impact driver after the intake is off, so we went ahead and got to work on that. And you can actually see the Phillips head screws on this thing still were trying to strip even though we were using an impact driver. So pro tip, go ahead and hit this prior to getting the intake off. Continuing along here, we decided that we wanted to get the fuel rail off of the intake. And when you are removing the fuel rail from the intake, make sure that you don't lose any of these little rubber O-rings that sit at the bottom of the injector. Unsure if these would come with any aftermarket injectors that you would buy, but if not, it's best to make sure you don't lose these ones. Underneath the intake hides some coolant hoses that still connect the intake to the engine so we had to go ahead and remove the radiator hoses to gain access to those. After gaining access to this area underneath the intake here, we removed our two coolant lines and we thought that we were ready to go ahead and take the intake off of the engine. In thinking that we had freed up the intake from anything holding it on to the side of the engine, we went ahead and filmed the bolt removal process of the main nuts and bolts that hold the intake to the side of the engine. There are four fasteners on the top side of the intake, there are two nuts on either far sides of the intake, and there are two bolts on the interior. You'll then find two bolts in the inner valley of the intake that you have to actually use a wrench to undo. And finally, there is a hidden bolt back behind the power steering pump. Ours was missing, but that is the last bolt that will be connecting your intake to the side of the engine. In actuality, there were two more things connecting the intake to the engine, and we didn't even think to look at this because we'd honestly never seen this prior to seeing it on our engine. There is this little bracket under the intake that connects the intake to the side of the block. Go ahead and get that removed. Then back up on the top side, we didn't notice this hose right here. This hose runs down to a little box that deals with the PCV of the engine, and we did need to take it off in order to get the intake off. The actual intake itself did end up being quite a bit of a pain to take off. We think it was getting stuck on one of the top two studs that were holding it to the engine. But with a rubber mallet and a little bit of squaring, we finally did get that off. Getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, probably after getting the intake off of the engine, we went and started attacking this really convoluted looking hard line in the valley of the intake. 
Three bolts and some hoses held this together, but once we got those out, we were able to just kind of Tetris it out from in between the intake. And with that out of the way, we went straight to throwing that in the trash. We say that we probably got a little ahead of ourselves because after that, we went ahead and separated the top collector here from the intake. And after doing so, it probably would have been a lot easier to get the hard lines off of the intake from there, but hindsight is 2020 in that regard. Five fasteners held down the collector to the intake as well as two coolant lines. There is a coolant line on the bottom portion of the intake connected to your heater hose hard lines. And there is also another coolant hose connected right underneath the throttle body. Now that we've gotten the two portions of the intake apart, it's a lot easier to go ahead and work on these little butterfly flaps. The screws that hold these butterfly flaps together are notoriously hard to get out and are pretty easy to strip. So we hit those with some brake cleaner. We hit them with some WD-40. And then we also went in with a small flathead screwdriver, a really small flathead screwdriver, and tried to clean out those screws as best as we possibly could to get as much bite with our screwdriver as we possibly could when attempting to remove them. Now, when trying to remove these, we thought that these were gonna be so stuck that they would require an impact driver. In actuality, they did not need that, and using the impact driver actually caused us a little bit of strife because the metal rod that the plates attach to is very thin and very fragile. The impact driver actually bent it just enough that it was getting caught while we were trying to remove it from the side of the intake. And if we wouldn't have hit that with an impact, it would have been a much more simple process to get this out of the intake. The hole that is on the side of the intake now as a result from removing those butterfly valves and that rod is a vacuum leak. So we need to go ahead and seal that up. What we did was we found a bolt that fit perfectly inside that hole and then we mixed up some JB Weld to secure it in place. You don't necessarily have to use a bolt that fits into that hole, but we felt that that would be a more secure option just in case that JB Weld didn't work. That being said, many people prior to us have done this JB Weld trick and it has worked perfectly fine for them from what we're aware, so we just wanted to be extra safe in doing this procedure. Now jumping back over to the collector portion of the intake, we just wanted to show you if you do decide to delete your air regulator and your idle air control valve, this is how you would do so. The hoses from each of those components feed into this hard line underneath the collector that's held on with two bolts. You go ahead and undo those two bolts and then the air regulator is also held in with two bolts. There are multiple ways to go about blocking off the vacuum leaks that are going to occur from deleting these two components. If you are deciding to delete both of these and also want to get rid of the idle air control valve completely off the back of your manifold, Hayes Drift Team has a delete kit that you can purchase on their website, which will be down in the description below. It's pretty spendy, but if you are wanting everything to look as clean as possible, then it is definitely the way to go. If you're looking for a more budget-friendly way of doing it, you may just go ahead and fabricate a little piece of metal to silicone over the hole that is left by deleting the air regulator and then just going ahead and capping off the hole for the intake air control valve. And if you really didn't want to do that either, you could probably just go ahead and put a cap on the end of the hard line that both of these components connect to and it would probably work the same as the other two methods. 
that about wraps things up in terms of simplifying the intake. So we're gonna go ahead and get that moved over to our new engine and installed. And then after that, we're gonna show you everything that we capped off on the manifold and then show you the installation of one coolant line that we used to simplify the convoluted loop of coolant that ran through the intake prior into one single loop. In the end, there should be seven hard lines that you need to cap off. On the right side of the manifold and in the very rear, there is one vacuum hard line. If you move up a little further on the right side in kind of the middle of the manifold, you'll see these two hard lines that were a part of the unnecessary coolant loop. You can go ahead and cap off both of those. Then if you move underneath the throttle body, there are two more hard lines that were associated with that coolant loop. You can cap off both of those. And then on the left side of the intake, there are two vacuum hard lines. Those can get capped off as well. Finally, to button up and complete the bypass of the convoluted coolant system that we just deleted, you'll need to go ahead and go down to the auto parts store and get about a foot long length of coolant hose to bridge the gap between your heater core hard line at the bottom of the frame here and run it up to the hard line that is just underneath your throttle body. If you stuck around with us for the convoluted process of getting that intake off of the motor, simplifying it and getting it onto the new motor, you can go ahead and now take a deep breath. That is all out of the way and that was the most complicated part of swapping all of the accessories from the old engine onto the new. Now we just went ahead and piece by piece took everything off of the old engine and then moved it over onto the new engine. We ended up taking one or two things off of the old engine before moving it over to the new engine, but for the video's sake, we went ahead and just made a time lapse of us taking everything off of the old engine side and then putting it onto the new engine. In the order of removal in this time lapse here, we went ahead and we removed the heater hose from the old engine. We removed the U-shaped coolant hose that goes from the block to the intake. We removed the two bolt flange for the coolant hose that's kind of behind the power steering pump. We removed the power steering pump so that we could remove the power steering pump bracket. We removed the thermostat housing. We remove the PCV box thing kind of next to the alternator. And in order to get to the alternator brackets, we had to remove the water pump pulley. With those alternator brackets, we remove the alternator. On the front of the engine, we remove the idler pulley. On the right side of the engine, we remove the AC compressor bracket. And then finally, we remove the two brackets for the engine mounts. Again, we didn't remove these all at once. We only condensed it into one little time lapse here for the video. We actually only pulled off one or two things at a time, clean them, and then move them to the new engine. The first thing that we moved onto the new engine was the flange for one of the coolant hoses. We cleaned both surfaces of this before applying some thermostat and water pump housing gasket. We snug those bolts down, allowing that gasket to set before going ahead and torquing it down later on. After that, we went ahead and secured that U-shaped coolant hose behind it back into place. And after we torqued down the bolts for the flange after that gasket had gone ahead and set, we went ahead and connected the associating coolant hose. Plugging right along, we installed the heater hose back onto the engine, as well as we cleaned up the surfaces for the little PCV box thing. We went ahead and put some silicon gasket sealer on that surface and bolted that down just like we did with our little coolant flange. We bolted that down just snug enough, letting that silicon gasket cure for a while before going ahead and torquing that down. We did go ahead and install the hose for that little PCV box that goes up into the top of your intake manifold. But because that hose did crack, we are going to replace it with something that we're just gonna pick up from the local auto parts store. We just went ahead and got this filmed anyways. 
we purchased a new thermostat so we went ahead and installed that after cleaning the surfaces of the thermostat housing for that we just went ahead and used some of that water pump and thermostat housing gasket snugging down those bolts until it had time to cure and then going ahead and torquing it down later While waiting for that thermostat gasket to cure, we went ahead and just installed the power steering pump bracket and the power steering pump. Up next, we installed our alternator brackets back onto the side of the engine. With that, we went ahead and installed our alternator. Our water pump pulley was installed after that. Then onto the front of the engine, we went ahead and installed our idler pulley. Down into the right side of the engine, we went ahead and installed our air conditioner compressor bracket. And then finally, we went ahead and installed our two engine brackets to the block. The next thing that we decided to tackle was something that we tried to save till the very end because it was pretty intimidating and that was to swap over the oil pump and the distributor. Since this dealt with timing, we were very careful to make sure that the old engine was at absolute top dead center so that when we moved our parts over to our new engine that was at top dead center, that it would still be timed properly on the distributor. In order to verify that our old engine was at true top dead center, we went ahead and pulled the spark plugs and that just made it easier for us to go ahead and turn the engine over so that when we looked into the first spark plug hole we could see that piston number one was at the top this however is not the only way that you go about verifying top dead center because even though cylinder number one is at the top we do not know if it is on the exhaust stroke or if it's on the compression stroke and if it's on the exhaust stroke when you move the distributor over to your new engine your distributor is going to be a full 180 degrees out in order to verify that you are truly at top dead center go ahead and look on your crank pulley and you'll see this little tab here should align with the marks on your crank pulley the second mark in from the left indicates your top dead center to further verify that our distributor was truly in time with our engine even though it was running prior to us removing it from our car we went ahead and marked on the distributor which point aligned with which cylinder and if we go ahead and remove the cover for the distributor you'll see that the rotor should be pointed at the number one cylinder point with all three of those verifications done we can go ahead and then remove our oil pump and when removing that there is the oil pump shaft that will come along with it this drives your distributor which is why we needed to verify timing before taking it off with a thorough cleaning of the mating surfaces and a new gasket this was simply brought over to the new motor and bolted right back in as added assurance before going ahead and taking the distributor off of the old engine we went ahead and marked these bolts with a sharpie in their position on the distributor so that whenever we move this from the old engine to the new we could go ahead and line those marks up just as they were on the old engine so that we know that the distributor is sitting exactly how it was prior Taking all those precautionary steps in the end did pay off because from what we're aware, the distributor is hard to get indexed on that oil pump shaft. It's in a half moon shape and if it's not just right, you won't be able to sit it down and get the distributor bracket bolted onto the flange. And you can even see in our footage that even we had a little bit of trouble getting it on, even from the small walk from the old engine to the new and trying to put it directly in. The little stem that indexes with that oil pump shaft just moved a little bit and we had to go ahead and reorient that before we could get it to sit back down. 
once that was installed, we went ahead and checked the two bolts on the distributor flange to make sure that they were sitting in the same orientation where we marked right before moving it over. We looked at the front of the engine on the crank pulley to make sure that that tab was showing top dead center. And then we went ahead and took the distributor cap off one final time just to quadruple check everything and make sure that the rotor was facing the number one point. There is finally four more things that we needed to pull off of the old engine, one of those being our oil pan. The next of those things being our oil pickup. And then finally, we need to go ahead and remove the oil dipstick tube and the oil dipstick. We needed to swap over the oil dipstick and the oil dipstick tube because as you can see in the footage on the S13 block, the oil dipstick tube is situated kind of in the middle of the block. On the D21 engine, the original dipstick location is at the rear. Because we are going to be putting this into an S13, we are going to be using our front sump oil pan, whereas the D21 has a rear sump. In order to use the S13 front sump oil pan on the D21 block, we had to actually go ahead and hand drill through the block. We won't be showing this on our video due to how risky it is to actually do this, but we hand drilled in the same location that the S13 block already has a hole in the D21 block. There's actually a spot in the casting where you can see the original hole would go, but we didn't want to show it in the video again just because it's so risky, the angle of the drill potentially cracking the block. There's so many things that could go wrong and we honestly don't want to be responsible if you accidentally mess up your block. We still need to do some modification to the oil pan and the oil pickup before we can put it on the new engine. But first, let's go ahead and get the old engine down and off the hoist. We are done stealing parts from it and it is now time to let it rest. Give it a couple pats, tell it that it did a good job. Since we owned it, it never left us stranded other than when the radiator kind of crapped out, but that was not its fault. Don't worry though, because this engine is not going to a junkyard. We're actually going to breathe new life into it once again. When we have the extra cash, we're going to go and get this machine and we're going to get it set up with the exact same forged internals as we have our engine now. We want to have it set aside as a spare engine for the future. Focusing on the present, we're going to be attaching this oil pan to an engine that now has a turbo. So in that sense, we need to go ahead and drill the oil pan to install an oil return bung to then install an oil return line. If you're following along and planning on doing this yourself, pay attention to where we went and drilled the hole for this bung because it would have been better positioned about a quarter to half an inch to the right. On the back side of the oil pan, there is some structural metal that ended up making it hard for us to tighten down our oil bung. We ended up having to hammer that and modify it slightly to make sure that everything sat flush. Just wanted to mention that so that you can learn from our mistake and not do it yourself. This is also a no weld style of bung, so it bolts up just like you would do with a nut and bolt, except there are two gasket washers that sit on either side of the oil pan, and when you tighten it up, those two gasket surfaces will seal from any oil leaking out. Be sure as well, if you are doing this yourself, to clean your oil pan after you go ahead and drill the hole for your oil bung. There is metal shavings in the oil pan and you do not want that getting into your freshly built engine. As for the modification that needs to get done to the oil pickup tube, there is a small bracket that held onto a portion of the block that we no longer have in our D21 block. So you can go ahead and cut this off with a Dremel or a cutoff wheel, but the thing is that's going to create a lot of metal shavings and you don't want any of those metal shavings near your oil pickup tube. Instead, we went ahead, just threw it in a vise and just wrenched it until that little bracket snapped off. It's definitely not as clean, but it gets it out of the way and there are no metal shavings. 
And with that bracket out of the way, you can go ahead and install your oil pickup tube. Make sure that you don't forget the little O-ring, otherwise you will have no oil pressure when you go to start the engine. Now, before we could go and install our newly modified oil pan to wrap up the engine, we have been putting off installing the rear main seal for whatever reason, so we're going to go ahead and get that done. We simply lubricated our new seal and then gently tapped it into place with a rubber mallet. That's technically not the greatest way to go about doing it, but it worked out for us and it didn't seem to damage the seal in any way. Once we got that installed, we made sure that the mating surface on the back side was nice and clean. Then we installed some black RTV silicon. Then right as we went to install the rear main seal onto the engine, we noticed that we couldn't get it on because of this little spacer on the end of the crankshaft. We asked some people about this and we've never seen this before. This block came out of a manual truck, so your guess is as good as ours on what it was. We used a two jaw puller like this just to pull that off of the end of the crankshaft. Then we were able to get the rear main seal on and bolt it down. And then while we were at it and while that little spacer was off, we went ahead and installed our pilot bushing for our transmission. Finally, after that, we laid down some black silicon RTV and got the oil pan installed. Not sure why we laid down the RTV on the block itself instead of putting it on the oil pan. There's literally a groove in the oil pan where you're supposed to put the RTV, but that's how we did it, and it seems to have worked out. Since we went ahead and installed our oil pan onto the engine with our new oil return bung, we felt that it would be appropriate to make our AN line that goes from the turbo outlet down into the oil pan. Now there are definitely better places to learn how to make AN line for any application that you are needing it for. But as for our application, we went ahead and installed our oil return flange onto the bottom of the turbo and then installed our AN fitting onto that. We also went ahead and installed our AN fitting to the side of the oil pan and we did this just so that we knew approximately just how long we needed to make our braided line so that we could go ahead and make our cuts for that. We also had to keep in mind that we are going to be still running our AC compressor so we had to make our line long enough to clear that. Once we kind of approximated the length of the line that we needed, we went ahead and wrapped our braided line with some tape as tightly as we possibly could. And then because we don't have any other better cutting methods laying around, we went ahead and just used a hacksaw to cut our braided line. This actually worked relatively well. There was a little bit of fraying on the underside of the line, but it was still able to thread into our AN fitting. Once getting that braided line installed into the threaded portion of that AN line, we had to go ahead and install the compression fitting. So the braided line side got held into the vise. We went ahead and lubricated both the compression fitting side and the inside of the hose. And then we simply tightened it down until both sides of the AN fitting sat flush with each other. Because we didn't have an AN wrench, this fitting did turn out looking a little nasty, but it threaded on perfectly to the fitting on the underside of the turbo and the fitting on the side of our oil pan. So once all things were said and done, we thought it actually came together pretty well. Finally, we ended up deciding on getting our fuel rail, taking our injectors out, and going ahead and installing our new Deechwork 1000cc injectors. We decided on 1000cc injectors to keep our duty cycle low for the power that we plan to make, while also still having the option to push the injectors harder if we want to go ahead and make more power in the future. The injectors are held into the fuel rail with a little o-ring, so with a simple tug you can pull them right out. We need to go ahead and pull the rubber spacers off of our old injectors and put them onto our new ones. The spacers get swapped over on all four injectors. We only did one for the video because we thought that would be explanation enough.
Now, before going ahead and reinstalling our injectors into our fuel rail, we went ahead and cleaned the inside diameter of the fuel rail itself. And then in the box provided by Deechworks is a small little package of lubricant. This is used on the small O-ring that sits inside of the fuel rail when you go to reinstall it. So let's go ahead and get those lubricated on all four injectors before installing them back into our fuel rail. It is a little tricky to line up all four injectors at the same time with their little indexes in the intake, but with a little bit of persistence you can definitely fit them all in at once. And as a note, in the package, Deechworks did include some of those rubber o-ring spacer things that sit on the intake portion of your injector. Unfortunately, in our application, those did not work. They were a little too small, so it's a good thing that we saved the original ones from the original injectors. Those worked perfectly fine with our new Deechworks injectors, and everything bolted up seamlessly. Okay, so we are going to call it there. We were going to install the oil feed line for our turbo, and we were going to install our oil filter sandwich plate to run that oil feed too, but we don't have the MPT fittings that we need to do that, so we're going to postpone that for the next video. It was kind of hard to figure out where to end this video because it's just a lot of little odds and ends that need to get done, and they don't necessarily correlate to each other. It's just stuff that needs to get done on the engine before we go ahead and toss it back in the car. Off camera, we will be going about getting the transmission installed onto this motor. If you are curious about how to do that, go ahead and go over to our video on our channel about manual swapping the S13 behind us where we have a very long and very detailed video on how to do that. We just want to have something to ourselves that we can do without recording. We've been getting a little disorganized in the garage. There's just stuff everywhere. There's little odds and ends that need to get done. And the transmission is going to be a nice little breath of fresh air. We're not going to record that. We're just going to do that on our own. That being said, we've gotten very far in the engine. It's looking like it's almost time to get this back into the car. In the next episode, we'll go ahead and button up some little odds and ends on the engine. We're going to go ahead and be prepping the engine bay and ready for our new engine. We're going to be doing some just general tidying up. We're going to be getting rid of some parts like the charcoal filter and some other stuff, as well as we're going to be getting rid of the battery tray that will be needing to get deleted in ready for the intercooler piping that we are going to need to run for our turbo. So if you ended up watching to the end of this very dense video, thanks a ton. It always helps with our analytics when people watch to the very end. If you haven't already, please consider going over to our Instagram at team.blush where we do lots of little updates and some behind the scenes stuff as well as just day-to-day -day stuff with the S13. We try and post as much as we can. And it is also the best way to get into contact with us. Just drop us a direct message over there if you have any questions, concerns, or inquiries about what we're doing or if you just want to chat. We love taking a look at what everyone else's projects look like and we actually get a lot of inspiration from you guys when you are showing us your own builds, especially with the KA. We've gotten lots of ideas from some of the viewers of this channel. With that, we're going to leave you with a hope you are having a good day or night, depending on what time it is when you are viewing this video. We hope to see you in the next episode on the channel where we're going to be getting this back into the car. And as always, take it easy.